hello, my name is Nicholas Boyce Smith, and I am your vicar. No, sorry, I am. Um, uh, I, I work for Create Streets, which is a social enterprise which uh, works with community groups in the built environment, trying to help communities uh, get the type of development they want. We call it the intensification and beautification of cities. And um, we've been working with uh, the Rendon Frognal Forum for a couple of months now to try and get your policies, get your policies right. Um, this is my colleague, Kieran Toms. Um, who has been working on it as well and will answer any difficult questions that I cannot answer. Um, I'm just realised I'm standing in front of the thing, so let me try and move. By the way, can you all hear me? I have a horror of microphones because I do go like that. So if you can hear me, I propose not to use it. Is that, is that okay, though? If you can't hear me, say so. Okay? Brilliant. So we're just going to quickly... and Actually, just one question, if I may. How... Um, how much would you say that you're understanding of and comfortable with the process that you've been going through, in terms of you know, just remembering it and knowing the detail, and on top of what neighbourhood planning does and doesn't mean, in terms of what you can and can't achieve? On a scale of 1 to 10, where 1 is I am ignorant and know nothing, and 10 is I am a genius and know all about it, where would you say you are? Just to 6. Is that about right? 3? Three? 3? Well, that lady's 3. Fine. Fine. Just, just to get a sense, so I don't, so I don't bore you or, or um, into too much detail. So we'll just quickly remind you what neighbourhood planning is, and if you want more detail or it's too much, shout non-content. Um, then John uh, will just quickly give you an update on the process you've been through over the last couple of years. We'll then talk just very quickly about a little bit of the work we've done with you. You're, you're not? No? You're sorry, I thought you were shaking your head at me in, in horror. No, that's fine. Um, uh, and then get to the, if you like, the meat of the sandwich. Uh, other than for vegans present, which will be the draft policies that we've, we're working up to try and achieve your, your aims and objectives. Um, and then I'll take questions. If, if there's bits that are very unclear as we're going, please just, just, just stick up a hand and say, that makes absolutely no sense at all. Can you explain that? I'd much rather that you understood what I was talking about, because it tends to be easier for, for communication. Um, OK. So just to remind you, neighbourhood planning is new. The Localism Act of 2011 introduced it. Um, it gives you as a local community, once you've gone through a local, manifest, a local referendum, actually significant input into the planning policies here in this bit of the world. But you do have to regard national planning policy, the strategic policies in your borough um, um, plans and EU obligations, and that's less of an issue. And the um, councils opine on whether you're in keeping with their policies, and the final decision is made by um, uh, the planning inspectorate. So you've got a lot of power at the end of the process, but not infinite power. Um, you sit at the same level as the local plan in terms of influence. Um, you, you've got to fit in with the very clear and massively increasing national government pressure for new housing, but you are able to provide for the type of dwelling, size, architecture, style, setting. So within that framework, you've got, you've got influence. And, and I don't think you need me to tell you that in London, the pressure to have new housing is, is certainly very high at the moment. That might change post-Brexit or non-Brexit, but that's one we can worry about another day. Um, uh, so, you know, you can say whether this is the type of new housing you do or, or don't want, but you do need to be providing for growth because that's within both the Camden and the London plan. Kieran, is anything I'm getting wrong that you'd add to that? Um, no. No, fine. I'll get lots of things wrong later, and Kieran will correct me, but up to now, not. Is this making sense? Is this too much detail, or is this okay? That's okay, fine. Um, I think it's... Um, Camden have given you decent scope. What is in a neighbourhood plan... By the way, can you see this? Is everyone okay to see this? What is in a neighbourhood plan is largely up to the community. Your plan can include as many or few topics as you want and be as detailed or general as you want. For example, a plan could provide guidance on what new buildings in the area should look like. Um, so that's the, uh, the elements of the Camden plan that we've picked up on in order to try and achieve your, um, uh, achieve your objectives. I'm going to jump over the rest of this. And this is roughly where we are in the process, which is actually a lot better than it looks. This, this is the hardest bit. The process you've already been through and that Nancy and others have led you through is the hardest part of the process. We're working with a range... Yes. Absolutely. I'm sorry that your microscopic eyes aren't quite picking up with our ludicrously small um, 
uh, slide. Kieran, who did the slide, I will kill later in consequence of it being too small. I'm so sorry. Um, process instigated by local community, neighbourhood area agreed uh, and designated by the council, and the neighbourhood forum agreed, I should add. Plan prepared by local communities with support from the, from the council support. Um, community engagement and consultation led by the forum. This, is the, this will be the next stage. Council check for legal compliance. That isn't a given uh, at any stage. Independent check, possibly, probably by the planning inspectorate. So they need to say, yes, this is, you know, th this is the real decision here. Then there needs to be a local referendum, which you need to win on a simple majority, though there's no lower limit. There's no lower limit, is there, on the, on the turnout? And turnouts have been pretty low, in fact, low to very low in most cases, though I'm not aware of a single neighbourhood plan that's failed because there tends to be a corpus of desire for it and not a corpus against it because it, it tends to be popular. Um, and then adoption by the council. In, in urban areas, these have been the real problems for most people. In, in the rural areas, it's been much quicker to take off after the, the Act came into force in 2012 because they were able to use the parish structure. In cities, because you need to create a neighbourhood forum, which needs to have 21 people who are across... You know, you've done all that. So you've been through the hardest bit in many, many ways. Um, I think that's, actually, that's what I just said, so I'll, I'll jump over that. Um, yeah, I mean, you, I think two points. We, we've spoken, as we started working with, with you um, and reflecting on some of our experience elsewhere, we've been speaking to some, some retired planning inspectors because they sort of tend to know how it works. And we've been trying to tease from them, well, what are the more effective neighbourhood plans? Because um, their view is that actually quite a lot of them are not very effective. And it's if you... Um, are really clear about what you want. I mean, I'm not sort of just using weasel words because a lot of a lot, there's a lot of weasel words in planning. Um, and if you allocate sites as far as you can, so if you actually get on the front foot and say, okay, because you know, we want development to be here, because then it becomes easier to say it shan't be there. So you've got to be sort of on the front foot. That's the guidance we've received, and that certainly fits with our experience. So in trying to uh, meet your objectives, which we'll come to in a moment. We very much reflected on that. So we're trying to get on the front foot in, in, in how we run it. Um, thank you. Right, John, can I ask you just to talk for a couple of minutes uh, about the journey that you've all been on? Uh, no, I, no, I am not familiar with, but um, that it, it is gathering pace and we look forward to being able to put it to a referendum. Um, having said which, um, neighbourhood plans often go through a number of drafts uh, before they're approved, and we don't know what our prospects are um, in relation to that. Um, my purpose in sticking myself up here tonight, rather like the comedian uh, Milton Jones, who I'd like to start this act by staring into space for a couple of precious seconds, totally bewildered, um, because the planning process at the moment can seem to over in. Um, we have a number of things come into force recently. Um, we all know about the national, we will know about the national plan, planning policy framework, which is really guidance to local authorities more than anything, although developers will quote it in their favour. Um, we then have the Local Urban Act, which Nicholas has spoken about, um, which uh, seeks to encourage us to uh, make policies and um, control our destiny. Um, the thing called the Housing Planning Bill, which has been going through and which causing some concern, has just become law, um, doesn't seem from first glance to make a great impact on planning. There, there is a, a good section on planning, but it seems mainly the act to be about housing, <coughs> social housing, and so on. Um, our function as a community. Um, is actually to engage with development, which sounds a sort of buzzword, um, but it is a matter of accepting that development will take place in certain places and in certain ways. Um, and we're not at war with this. Um, we may find some applications that are uh, less than good from our point of view, um, and we obviously want to comment on those and as, we do, as we become once our neighbourhood plan is approved, I think comments will be made to the uh, neighbourhood forum, um, probably firstly rather than the local authority. Um, but we'll see how that works. 
So, Nancy, will you correct me, or John, if I get this wrong? So, this is the journey you've been on, just to remind you, which has been a long journey for several years. Um, and you've done, a, I think, a, a pretty good amount of community engagement. So, you're, you know, you're, you're building up a corpus of evidence that you've engaged with the wider community. And I'm not going to read all this out to you. But it's very important to have these numbers in terms of the emails that are reaching, um, responses you're getting, you know, media hits. You know, this, this is the type of evidence that we know from, from our work elsewhere in London you know, has impact with, with local councils, quite rightly, because it shows it's not just you know, 75 people in a church hall on a, on a rainy Monday afternoon. It's actually you know, more, more than just that. Um, sorry, going too fast. You've also built up um, over the last uh, year, year and a half, a, a very good corpus of evidence about the character of your area. So ACOM have done a character and heritage assessment, which I'm sure many of you have seen. Um, you've got the report on trees, the nitrogen dioxide monitoring, uh, bat flight paths, which we've not seen previously before, I must confess. Um, um, and, uh, and you've also been able to access uh, uh, work by Arup on un unidentified water under the ground. So you've got um, original research. your own original research. I can honestly say you may be unique in the country in having done that. I don't know that factually, but I suspect you are. So you've got, you know, you've got a good corpus of evidence on which your work can stand, which I think is important. Yes, it's all part of Hampstead Neighbourhood Forum. So we actually follow these boundaries up to here. Here, we then include school here, University College School, and these houses, and then it becomes a bit complicated. So Oak Hill Way is not included. Uh, Spelling Close is not included. So here, there is a bit of a ragged boundary, which is basically the boundary set by Hampstead. These are the objectives that, that you and your neighbours uh, uh, got to in 2015. Preserving and enhancing range of property characteristics, uh, preserving greenery, creating new green public realm, uh, enhancing the environment, sustainable growth, um, the conservation area as a, as a centre and for arts and for culture, and uh, preventing inappropriate basement excavation. We then started working with you in March, I think, in March, to put some, if you like, some meat on those, on those bones. I'm going to stop up a bit now, because otherwise we'll be here until midnight, which none of us, none of you want us to be, I'm sure. We then spent some time walking around the neighbourhood with some of you, um, looking for potential development sites, uh, looking at Finchley Road, the hodgepodge that is in some ways now uh, present there, looking at some of the strengths that many of you identified as the bits of the, of the area that you liked, uh, the mansion blocks, um, looking at what's happening to front gardens, that's a theme that's come up consistently, worries about front gardens, their treatment, their paving over for car parking, uh, the degree to which that is or isn't appropriate. Um, the, the, the complexity, the red brick character, the Edwardian character of the, of the area, something that's consistently come through. Here are some of the details that we're now thinking about how we work into the plan. Arches over windows, carved stone, uh, metalwork, uh, large trees, hedges, and a real sense of risk uh, to that, in particular in some streets. Um, also identified some potential sites where uh, uh, development might be possible. That's not an efficient use of space. Is there something that could be done there? It's not beautiful. It's underutilised. You know, various sites that emerged. Um, uh, I think I'll jump over that. Here are some of the... I think we literally just walked past that just now. Many instances, which clearly many of you mentioned to us, of houses being knocked down and replaced. I think, I think it'd be fair to summarise, most of you felt with something that was less appropriate or attractive than, than what had been there. Um, this just shows you, I mean, something you will all know, the, you know, the difference that the, the greenery, the trees, the hedges makes from, uh, from, from one street to another, or indeed from one side of a street to another. And there's some desire to preserve and enhance that um, as part of the keeping of, of, of the, of the neighbourhood area. There are some of the bushes. Um, Here's some modern housing done reasonably well. I mean, I'm not going to get into judgments, but you can like it or dislike it, but at least it fits in with the, the massing, the tone, the scaling, the, 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 the sense of details of, of the more historic area. Um, new garages, variable quality, mainly felt to undermine the streetscape, but some are better than others. Um, key site, now this comes very much to the, to the point that you were raising uh, at the back. Just to remind you, it's really important that you all have this firmly in your heads because I'm afraid it's true. Sites that have already received planning permission, 
you will not post hoc influence. There are very a few ways in which you can if they come up for changes in planning permission, but it's best to imagine that you won't, then maybe you get lucky. But stuff that's already gone through the system, you cannot influence, just as a statement of, 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 of primary statute. Um, and the, the, uh, the, um, the, the former King's College site essentially is, uh, is probably too late to influence. The, the, that you may get lucky, but I think you should probably assume that you won't. Um, so working back to your objectives, we started, I'm going to jump over this, um, we've started coming up with um, a range of policies, but two, two bits which is just worth quickly explaining. One is, and we, we talked about this at, at, at some length, something called design codes. So Camden and the, and, the, and, and the Greater London Authority have a very clear and I think defensible desire to create new housing. And that's creating pressure on all parts of London. So we, we ran a workshop in March with some of you and with, with others saying, OK, if, if this new housing is coming, how can we influence it? What do we want it to be? Um, and where we got to was that as part of the neighbourhood plan, we would create a form-based design code. Now, if any of you are sitting there thinking, what the, does that mean? Let me, let me try and say, could you just flip to the next slide? Um, and uh, we're working you know, for you with a firm called Acom to do this. Um, uh, a design code is... Actually, just flip ahead just two slides, Kieran, there. Now, this isn't for here, okay? I've deliberately taken something not for here. So a form-based design code says this is the type of development that is permissible in this area. And it actually literally uses images. You can back the images up with numbers. So it's talking about things like front, you know, what's the ratio um, from windows to front, how much detailing in, in there is, uh, how much detailing is there. Can you just go back one slide? Um, how are, this is one we probably won't get to, how are streets defined? What's the nature of the urban blocks? What type of buildings are here? Detached, semi-detached, blocks of flats, commercial buildings, and the, and, and the public realm. Just flip on two. So I'd, I'd forgotten that Kieran was there, and I can ask him to. So this is, again, this is not for here, quite deliberately. This is to give you the concept. Um, uh, this is one, it's part of a BIMBY toolkit that we work with a bit in other parts of, of, of the country. So, you know, defining the types of terraced house, ratio of windows, acceptable, not acceptable, uh, proportions of windows. And just flip on one, I think this is how perhaps, for example, a street front would work in terms of um, the relationship between the street and, and the front of the house. This is a design code that was used in the, in the, in the West Country, in the development in Sherford. You flip on one more. Um, now, uh, a firm called ACOM are working up a design code for you, which is not yet here, so you know, more, more work will be required, but we're, we're, we're in flight. Um, we've helped them structure that. Um, and to define what types of development are permissible. And we've given them some of the, if you like, some of the, the, the metrics. So how many stories? Can there be a semi-basement? What's the height to the pavement? Plot width? How wide is a building? How far set back is it? How deep is the plot? So presence of soft garden in the, in the front, sorry, soft landscape in the front garden, back garden. Is there a side garden? Building depth? Is the bike park in barking? Uh, facade detailing, window proportions, solid to void ratio, that means the ratio of the window to the overall uh, facade at the front, variety in story height, porches, and if you just flip on one more, and ACOM who are working this up at the moment are also adding at our request, well, your request, um, in details on detailing, so facade proportions, balconies, roof line, treatment of, of, of fronts and window proportions. So the reason for doing this, and actually I, I think I'm right in saying this is not something that any neighbourhood forum in the country has done before. Um, though we've spoken to Camden about it at some length, we've also looked at national guidance. In fact, I actually spoke, and I'm, I, mean, I am on camera, so I don't want to say this, but we spoke to people in DCLG and to ministers to check that we were okay on this, um, is to give you a level of control over what comes there. So to the lady in the back, I'm sorry, I don't know your name, so that were one of those developments to come in a year and a half, and were this plan to go through and to be voted on and approved, you would be able to say, but I'm sorry, you know, we're, you know, the neighbourhood plan says that the brick needs to be this colour and we're looking at this level of detailing on the facade. So this is just not compliant. So it would put you in a position of power compared to the status quo, where the Camden plan, the local plan, demonstrably doesn't do that. There are words, as there are in every local plan in the country, about you know, being appropriate and fitting in, but frankly you can choose that to mean whatever you like, and people do. Can we move on? Um, does that... Makes sense. Does that? Am I vaguely explaining myself with reasonable clarity? Okay, thank you. 
Now, the other thing that we've agreed to do to try and bring your policies to, to light and to give them teeth is to allocate sites as much as possible. Again, this is something that most neighbourhood plans don't do because it is harder, um, but you're lucky because we're cheaper than most people doing this, so we're able to do more for the same amount of money. Um, so the point about allocating sites is that shows that you really are getting on the front foot and you're saying we want housing to happen and we want it to happen here. Now, the problem with allocating sites is it's more work and you, it's not, you need to go through a, a viability test, which isn't a viability test as it's often used in the media. What it means is this site could be developed and is, you know, is likely to come on the market. Now, we're not privy to detailed financial or private knowledge about the landowners of some of these sites, which we'll come to in a moment. Um, but where there's one, where we think there's reasonable cause to believe that it is likely to come on the market, is that the next page, Kieran? Uh, no, okay. Just, just jump on one more and then I'll come uh, to the next one, isn't it? So this one here, I'm sorry, I'm jumping, up, jumping across here. 27 Reddington Gardens, we haven't finished this. This is the draft site allocation on the right. It's not finished, and we still don't ha quite have enough evidence to back up that it's a site that's likely to become available. We believe it will, but we just need to try and get a little bit more of a factoid there. So this is to try and put you, the community, on the front foot. And if you're looking at that building and saying, but I love that building, I want that building to stay, this is, or at any rate, subsequently with uh, Nancy and John and others, you need, and Gordon, you need to say, I'm sorry, I want this to stay, but we're of the view, based on what we've heard from you, and frankly what we think, this is horrible, um, it's clearly in bad state, there's reason to believe it's likely to be developed, well, let's allocate that site for development and say we'd like something to go here which isn't that and which is better. That's the logic. Now, there's a range of other sites. Is it the next, next slide? Sorry, I have jumped ahead here. Um, there's one there at the back of Finchley Road, and then if you go down two, there are one Platts Lane, Quality is Hotel in Frognall, the rear of 27A Frognall, and that's, that's it. Is there, are there any more? That's, that's the lot, isn't it? You need to state how many units there'll be on the site, and that needs to be you know, consistent with Camden's policy and all the, all the policies. So you, need, for, you can't propose a hugely dense building, likewise you can't propose on a big... The Camden policy seems to be flexible with uh, the but, but that's the point. You don't give them that flexibility. If you get through with this, you stand at the same level in the planning process as Camden's local plan. You're equal with them. So if you're coming in here very clearly, allocating a site or not so good uh, recommending a site, which is not as powerful, and you're putting a carapace around that, saying that the, the density per hectare for this site should be between blah and blah, so, you know, medium rise and, and, it's, and it's detailing and design should be this, you're making it, again, I won't say impossible, because that's a dangerous thing to say, but you are certainly making it exponentially harder for someone to use that site differently. So that first site, one opposite you, um, is we're proposing to actually formally try and allocate. We may not manage to, but we're going to try. The others we're just going to put in as recommendations, which is not as powerful. But we think it's all we can do. Um, I don't think there's much to say on this. Kieran, what would you add on design and access statements? Design and access statements is a necessary statement that any developer has to make about a new development. So we're saying that in addition to the site appraisal, it's got to be a biodiversity impact, tree and hedge survey, flood risk, um, and the use of soft service. So we're forcing them in their design statement to be thinking about the things that you have been talking about. Yeah, and look, we work with developers. Developers are rational. Yes, they want to make money. But they, the best way to get money is to get it built. And you know, if they're being forced to think about these things, they have to say something. They can't just completely put it under the carpet. Is there anything you'd add on that? Um, it's worth bearing in mind that um, some of the things which we're asking to be included in the design and access statement, um, some of these are, are covered in other policies. So it's a kind of way, uh, double level of consideration needs to be given uh, by the developer. So here, they need to consider it in their overall vision. But we'll see in other policies that there are some specific elements that they need to adhere to uh, on these issues, which are the same issues that we've heard from you uh, along the way, so including in the workshop and in your visions and objectives. Brilliant. Thank you, Kieran. Um, oh, it's frozen. That's good. It's defrozen. Um, air quality. I mean, you've done some excellent work on this. Um, showing that, you know, 
as in much of London, there are real air quality issues uh, in parts of, uh, of this part of London. So we've put in, again, a requirement, uh, you know, detail, detail on uh, associated air pollution during the construction and any demolition. I mean, I don't, we could get, there's a huge detail we go into there, but it, you know, I think we're persuaded that, again, we're, we're forcing them to, to, to focus on that. Again, anything you'd add, Kieran, on that? Uh, during construction, um, that the, the, a CMP, construction management plan is something that a developer needs to give to the council to prove how they're going to mitigate the impact of their construction and that, that therefore is a good way in for a neighbourhood plan to have an impact on that sort of, uh, of that, how it affects it there. If there's a lot of construction going on in an area then the air quality will be, will, will suffer as, as so again, the, the aim of this is to, you know, the developers have to do this anyway, they have to put in a construction management plan, but it's to force them to focus on this issue. Um, uh, noise and vibration, I don't, I mean, this is nature similar about the level of noise um, and vibrations that, that development uh, creates. Obviously all this is being shared round and you'll get the full draft. I'm gonna move on a bit though, because I don't think that's very controversial. This, this I think is a very important one and has been really fundamental in much of the feedback we've received from some of you, which is the, what I was talking about earlier in those photographs, the, the green nature of the borough, the, uh, the fact that you don't have parks or large public open spaces, even small public open spaces, and that actually the, the greenery on the streetscape and in the associated side and back gardens is an important part of the, of, of the character of the area. Um, you've already done some good work on that, which we're able to use as evidence. We think we're in quite a strong position in terms of evidencing that in the planning process. Um, and as you can see here, and again, I, I hope this is readable. Um, we may not get all this through Camden, I should say. Um, please don't put the full video on the website, me saying that. Um, you know, we, we might be pushing our luck a bit here, we're not quite sure. Um, but demanding an increase in soft permeable service by 10% or 20% when there's basement erosion, that's very much on your uh, question, um, in terms of getting that area which absorbs the water and r removes the flood risk. Two, when a tree has to be taken down, when anti-trees being taken down, two having to be planted instead, we've provided, or you've provided, and we've put in a list of appropriate tree types, which again will be all fully shared with you. Um, developers having to contribute on green space, um, and always a retention of at least 50% of existing garden space. Almost that, I mean, I wonder if that number could be higher or lower. Hedges being reinstated, um, and uh, some constraints around extensions and infill developments. Again, Kieran, I think I've, I think I've missed just it. A, a lot of this. I know we talked a little bit about conservation areas earlier. Um, a lot of this ties into the fact that in the conservation area policies, um, which is descriptions, that green space, even if it's not public, but if it's in people's private land, contributes a lot to the character of the area. We're, we're using that element of the um, of the conservation area that definition of the character to inform these poli policies um, and then as, as Nicholas says we believe that this would make it a strong argument to get through Camden it's also worth bearing in mind that Camden will, will respond to these they may not be 100% happy with everything that goes in there but Ultimately, the decision is made by the planning inspectorate. Um, so there may be some scope, and it, is, 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 it will definitely be a process of working out which things we want to push, which things we think actually maybe Camden have, uh, have, have kind of said, have been correct in saying that it, we're pushing against what they're saying too much. But a lot of what Camden say and a lot of what we've got from from yourselves through the process, there's a lot of, of crossover in what you believe. I'm sh I know lots of people uh, also uh, are aware of examples where maybe Camden and Red Frog's uh, aims or, or goals don't cross over, but we've tried to find, find those things to make Camden happy, but ultimately to prove to the planning inspectorate that we fit in with all the relevant policies, which I guess is the point more broadly on, on, on both these and other things. But, you know, this, we, we are, going beyond, though in line with, what's, um, uh, you know, what, what's, what's currently in the conservation policies. This is on local green spaces, so this is very much aligned to that. Um, 
and the, the West Heath Lawn Tennis Club is already a, um, uh, um, uh, a consented open space, and we're suggesting, again, based on feedback from you, uh, that the, the covered reservoir is added to that. And that just means that it's, uh, um, it's that in future, that it would be protected from development with the idea being that in future it, it may, the potential remains for it to be opened up as a, um, a public green space of, of, some, of some sort. It protects it from being taken away and that potential being lost. Trees and hed hedges, uh, major focus on both protection of trees and when they have to be taken down, which does sometimes happen in building for other reasons. They're their replacement with two, two, uh, two trees instead. Uh, got a list of trees that are appropriate, um, demanding a tree and hedge survey for all planning applications. So really having to, and you know, this isn't something, you, you, many of you will be right to be cynical about developers, I'm cynical about developers, but they have to get planning permission. And this becomes something that they, they then can't walk away from. So they're being forced to come up with words and thus manage properly with actions to to preserve or enhance the greenery. What would you add on that, Kieran? Um, yeah, it's, it's that it, we're, we're seeking with this to both stop greenery being taken away, but also, where possible, when there's new development, actually, and it can serve, it serve to enhance it, so to, to take active steps to in, increasing the amount of, of greenery. And that's bearing in mind what, what, what um, we've learned from you about the loss of greenery in the area. The, uh, the, the neighbourhood plan is able to um, state that the what the community needs about these uh, community facilities, uh, that they have an important, that they're important to the community, uh, and so this will help safeguard protect these community facilities uh, and will add an extra layer of protection to them. It's not the the thing about these. It's not you don't have to prove. Unlike when you're allocating a site, you don't have to prove that these are likely to be uh, removed or demolished or replaced. And this is simply about as the community affirming that these are important to the character of the area. They fit in with the objectives earlier, and saying this is important to the community. We want to preserve them. Okay. Um, the other powerful thing that. Um, and I should have thought about this to the, to the lady at the front. Um, um, the other very powerful thing that a neighbourhood plan gives you as a community is control over 25% of the SIL money. That's the community infrastructure levy, which developers essentially have to pay. So you get to direct where that goes. And now, you're, we're not talking enormous developments in this area, so it's probably quite modest amounts of money, but nevertheless, it, it isn't nothing. Again, I think uh, a process that some of you ran led to... Um, this list emerging from that uh, use of SIL allocation. So the provision of new streets and hedges, uh, specific places for pocket parks, um, restoration of granite paving stones, conservation area signage, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I'm not going to read you the whole list. So this is, e even if, and I think there are a couple in the room, even if several of you think that having an open plan in place gives you no power in the planning system, which is incorrect, but even if you think that, this is a more measured, you know, this is a very measured thing. So even if something gets built that you hate, the, this, this, some portion of the money goes to things like this, which is not, I think I'm correct in saying, none of that is in any, any Camden expenditure at the moment. I think I'm correct in saying. So, you know, this is a, were your plan to be in place, this would be a very, fine, you know, be a very clear distinction. And again, to you as the community, if you're looking at that list or looking at it when it comes round and thinking, this list is completely wrong, well, it's for you to say so. What, what we got from the conversation, and you'll see in this slide and the next couple of slides, is that certain ways in which new developments can contribute to different elements of the street design, which may be not necessarily the buildings, but are uh, certain road layouts or uh, different focus on cars or, 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 or cycling. And that it was felt in the process we've been through with the neighbourhood forum that these can have a positive impact on the character of, of a street uh, in the way that cars or people or cyclists move down it and the different ways the space is allocated. Uh, so this is sustainable transport, which is with um, cars. Cycling has its own policy, and that's this quite specific 
things here about, about what cycling can do. Uh, it was felt from the conversation in the workshop that although probably it's fair to say uh, some of these transport issues um, didn't come across, weren't as high up people's list of priorities, but it was felt that they offered a good opportunity. Um, so yeah, that, that is the, that is the policies. Um, it's worth bearing in mind, you can circulate this, a lot of writing in there, but it can be circulated, you need to digest over, the, over in the bar. This is, the, this is the legible one from earlier, so sorry that it's so small. And, um, and so this is where we, it's what we need to do next. We, there's still work to do on the plan. Crucially, um, uh, we're still waiting uh, to get the full design code from ACOM, and obviously that will be shared with you by members of the forum. Um, council needs to screen it to check that we don't trigger um, uh, an environmental impact assessment, which we don't think it will. It's not big development territory. Um, we're busy not trying to trigger one of those somewhere else in London at the moment. Um, once that's done, and once obviously all the policy is in place, then there can be the first formal consultation um, uh, if a, 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 an environmental assessment is required, then there's a technical analysis which they perform, not us. I don't think we'll be in that situation. They then have got various uh, statutory consultees they need to interact with Again, I don't want to credit hostage to what you know. We're not aware, we can't think of any likely major issue there. I mean, we may have missed something. Um, and they will, I think I can guarantee, come back and make suggestions about changes. And then I think that there needs to be a discussion to have which ones are we comfortable with, which are helpful, some will probably be helpful, which are we uncomfortable with, do you want to make some tactical withdrawals so that they can uh, you know, support it. We've put in a couple of things there on... Uh, greenery and base, well, greenery, not basements, m that they might be pushing too far. You know, we'll have to make a, well, you'll have to make a decision, I should say, as to whether you give ground a bit on those in order to get other things through. Um, they may come back on design codes. Um, they may say it's too, exactly what you said. In fact, that's quite, that's possible. Um, that's not what they've, that's not the intimation they've given, but they might, in which case that, that's the discussion that, that, that you need to have. And, and the formal consultation in this and indeed in many planning processes is quite strongly controlled. So you have to write letters to various people. You have to make, you know, you have to make it very clear in public announcements, physically, in media, ideally, that this is happening. So this is pre that, but there is that point at which you know, the forum needs to formally go through that process and be able to evince to Camden that they've done that. And if the process is not followed technically correctly, you get struck back and have to start again. Um, the constraint on individuals is there is a minimum. So there is a legal minimum for the number of people who are formally in the neighbourhood forum, which is 21. And that, that Camden judges... Yeah. Well, look, well, you, I, I, yeah. But th those are the people who... Are, hang on, I think you're missing the point. Those are the people who are legally constituted as the forum. They are putting themselves forward to, to be part of that body. And Camden and indeed every other council in the country needs to be contented that those 21 people are a, a fair cross-section of the community in terms of age, location, race, sex, anything else they want to cut. And uh, just because this isn't something we did with you, it is something we've done with several other forums. Um, in our experience in London, at any rate, it is something councils take incredibly seriously. One of the reasons, to your earlier question, lady here, that these things take so long is actually it tends to be quite hard to tick all the boxes that councils want you to tick in terms of making sure you're fairly representing every geography location. So that is one of the reasons why these things take so long to do. The actual process of consultation then, the forum will be in a much stronger position, I can assure you. The, the stronger they can show in terms of hundreds or thousands of people getting emails, responding, the, the stronger their case will be with the planning inspectorate. We're quite deliberately... The Highgate Forum is, is if you like, ahead of us on that process and are in protracted conversations with Camden on that. It's quite a complex area. Camden Council, with Camden Council. So, uh, Nancy may want to comment on this in a moment. We, together with you, we've, we've made the call. Let's not get into that now. Let's let, let them run ahead on that. 
hopefully get to a policy which we believe, based on the conversations that Nancy's had with them, is likely to be something that the wider community supports. If it's not, then clearly back to square one. Um, if it is, um, then fine. But it's about putting a credible constraint around basements, but not to the very sensible point at the back, but not so ecumenically so, so as to just not be something that the planning inspector would, would accept. So if, if we're completely doctrinaire that in no situation in a, you, you won't, I think, get it through. So it's about getting that nuance right. But what we're hoping is we know Camden and another forum are going through a lot of pain on this at the moment, is ideally let them take the pain and then just pick up the intellectual capital at the end of the process. But because we're not formally starting the consultation today, you know, clearly we're not, we're not at the point where we can credibly consult on that. Does that, does that help a little bit? Um,